Okay, you can, uh, you always say grab a seat. How do you grab a seat? I, I just don't get that. But anyway, I guess you can, you can sit down. Thanks, uh, Debbie, the worship team, the ushers, greeters, tech crew. We're very, very grateful for uh, all the labor of love that, that you do. You know that <clears throat> he provides all that we need. It's, it's biblical. It's what it tells us in Philippians. Paul writes, my God, a personal God, will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ. And our God is very, very rich, and he's very, very generous, and uh, it's on his heart uh, to give. Um, well, happy Mother's Day to all of you. Whether you are a mother or not, uh, we're just glad that you're here with us today. And, and kids, we want to thank you. you. You did some serving out there with your moms and uh, everything, huh? Yeah. Um, they, they had a nice sister's lunch here yesterday. You know, I crashed the party yesterday, the, the sisters, uh, and, and I wanted some food. But I was very disappointed. They would not even give me a morsel. Uh, but uh, anyway, they, I think there's around 60 of them that, that were there, and, and uh, they had a blessed uh, time, time together. Uh, children, speaking, speaking of, of uh, your mothers, uh, I've, I listened to a song. It's a song by Annie Wilson, and it's called Mamas. So I, I just thought I would go through the song with you very, very quickly. I said, I don't know why he made growing up, but I guess we're all gonna. I don't know a lot of things, but I know why God made mamas. And here it is. For the open arms to fall into, for the when you don't know what to do, for the phone call saying, don't forget I'm always in your corner. For the heart that makes a house a home, for the knowing that you're not alone, for the darling, don't you dare give up, even when you wanna. That's why God made mamas. For putting Band-Aids on a scraped up knee, wiping tears away, for picking up the pieces when that dream don't go your way. For always giving, more than taking, always knowing what you need, and always showing you that's fighting always best on your knees. So you mothers and women in general, fight for your children. Fight for your grandchildren. We don't live in a pleasant world, and the best thing you can do is to be on your knees for your kids, for your grandkids, for, for others. Um, I want you gals today, you sisters, to see yourself through God's eyes. Not what you see in yourself, not what others even see in you, but what God sees in you. He knows you through and through, He knows your needs. If you have an outline, there are several things that are mentioned. You know them. It's the basic needs of mankind. But their love and security and significance and honor, companionship, acceptance, hope, protection, faith, guidance, and above all else, what you all need is intimacy with God. Intimacy is a growing friendship by definition that develops over a long period of time. It doesn't happen overnight. You can come into Christ overnight, but a growing intimacy is something that you should long for. And I want to share a principle with you gals this morning, and I want to introduce it by a story. It's a true story about a little boy by the name of, of uh, Mark. And he's 10 years old, but prior to that, he had his left arm severed in an automobile accident. But he had a passion and, and desire, despite that, uh, to get involved in, in judo. And so his parents were a little bit reluctant, but he, they decided he would go along. So they got an old a Japanese judo instructor to begin to train him. And so he trained. And after three months' time, 
um, he, he learned a move. And Mark went to the instructor and says, we've been training for three months, and I only know one move. He says, that's enough. Just, just keep training. So several more went, months went by, and the instructor told him, I said, Mark, I think you're ready for a tournament. Well, he says, okay. And so uh, just one move is all he knew. And so he won his first match. He won his second match. A third match was a little bit tougher, but the guy made a wrong move, and boom, finished. But then there was a f- the final. And in the final, uh, there was this bigger dude and a lot more experienced and stronger and so forth like that. Things were not going so well, and the, the, the refereeing official wanted to call the match, but the old Japanese master instructor says, let him go. And so uh, they kept going, and all of a sudden he made a wrong move, and 10-year-old Mark threw him to the ground and won the match. As they're driving home, Mark says to his instructor, he says, hey, how in the world did I win with only one move? He looked at him and said, well, you won for two reasons. The first is you have almost mastered that one move. But secondly, the only defense against that move is to grab your left arm. (laughs) One, how do you win, you gals, in this life, in this world in which we live in? I would like to suggest to you to embrace weakness. It's counterintuitive. You won't read about it or you won't see it on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, Newsmax. None of those stations will have that. But uh, this book we call the Bible, which we call the Word of God, is filled with men and women who were weak, who God made strong. We sang some songs this morning about that. And the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians shares uh, these words. I want you to look at these words, and I want you to follow along with me. This is what he says. My grace is sufficient for you. Women tried to find, girls tried to find, you sisters tried to find sufficiency in other things. My grace, he says, is sufficient for you, for power, note, is perfected in what? In weakness. Now, look at what he says. Most gladly, therefore, I will boast about my weaknesses. Why? So that, purpose clause, the power of Christ may dwell in me. And this next line in here, you will never find any place in our secular news. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses. You have them, your weaknesses. I have plenty of weaknesses, not that many strengths. But Paul says, I am well content with weaknesses, with, notice, insults with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties. Now, here's the reason why, and here's the motivation. For Christ's sake, when you live a life in his presence for his glory, that's living for Jesus, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then, and only then, am I strong. Embrace your weakness. I want you gals today to say this verse. You're going to say it over the course of what I share with you more than one time. I want you to do it. I'll just start, and then you read it. The grace... There are three words I want us to key on today, and as I do that, if you would open your Bible up to the Gospel according to Luke, the seventh chapter. 
It's grace. There's a source. It comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. And the love of God the Father, that's the kind of Father that we have, those of us that are actually in Christ. And notice, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I guess according to this verse, the Bible would tell us that the Holy Spirit is a real person. You cannot have fellowship without being a real person. The grace of God, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. In Luke's Gospel, the seventh chapter, we read these verses. This is not an unfamiliar story to many of you. If you're with us today for the first or second time or something like that, it may be new to you. We're certainly glad that you're here. But in verse 36, it says, Now there was one of the Pharisees was requesting Jesus to dine with him. And Jesus, uh, even though he knew all was going to take place, he entered the Pharisee's home and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, and she brought an alabaster vial of perfume and standing behind him at his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, uh, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him. That she is a sinner. Those are the only kind of people that there are in the world, sinners. And this woman was enslaved in some way, shape, or form to sin. A particular kind of sin, apparently, from the context and so forth here, but Enslavement to sin can come in many different shapes and many different sizes, and there's many different words that we could use. But no matter who you are, where you are, what you're going through, once you have understood the truth about your own heart sinfulness, and you come to Christ by faith, don't linger on the past. Bury it. Don't look back in the rearview mirror. You can't change it. It's done. And according to the story that we're going to look at, it's going to be forgiven if you come in faith. Instead, look at the great, vast, notice, measureless magnificence of the love of God. You cannot even comprehend the height, the depth, the breadth, the length of the love of God for you. Just like you children, you cannot comprehend the love that your mother has for you. She would give her life for you. And so we come to Christ. And I want us to see those three things. Remember the word grace, the word love, and the word fellowship? It was grace that freed this woman. And in light of weaknesses, as I mentioned before, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 8 and 9, you, you wonder sometimes, why am I going through this, this the dilemma? Why am I in the spot that I'm in? Paul says, we were burdened excessively beyond our strength. Here's the purpose. So that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. God puts you, puts me in particular situations where there's no way out, where it seems like it's a dead end. There's no hope, no way possible. And as you read this book, especially in the Old Testament, you find God's people, God's men, women here 
who were burdened excessively beyond their strength, they were going to be wiped out by the enemies, and they had a plethora of them, one nation after another, after another, after another. And so Paul says now, as believers in Christ, one of the things that God wants to do in your life and my life is to bring us to the end of ourselves so we don't trust in ourselves. I met with a friend of mine this week over a cup of coffee who's had such a heartache in his family. He hasn't seen his daughter for now I do not know how long. And he looked at me across the table, and the last two times I was with him with tears in his eyes, and he says, but I trust in the Lord with all my heart. I try, Glenn, not to lean on my own understanding because it doesn't comprehend. In all my ways, I try to acknowledge him so that he can make a path forward. There was no quick, easy answers, and tomorrow will be the same as today unless something miraculous takes place. It was the grace that freed her. It tells her that when she knew that Jesus was in this Pharisee's house, she barges right in. She had no business. She had no invitation. And, and, and I assume that she had already experienced the relationship to some degree with Christ, and she felt comfortable just barging in. So I'd say when she learned, she, she broke into this dinner. Verse 37 says, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. We read another story about Mary who brought an alabaster vial of perfume in, in uh, John chapter 11, or chapter 12, I'm sorry. It was worth 300 days' wages, and she poured it out on Jesus, anointing him for burial. I do not know how much was in this particular vial or alabaster jar, but, but she brought it, something extravagant. She spared nothing. And there she is. And she wept at his feet. And she had to kneel because the scriptures say she began to wet feet, his feet with her tears and wiping them with the hair of her head. She had to get down on her hands and knees to do that. And kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. That's why I say I think she experienced his love, his grace, his compassion before. And so she comes. How about you? You have that kind of thankfulness and praise and worship in your heart for what he has done. Debbie led us this morning in some songs that had to do with there's power in the blood. There is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. The blood is the most powerful substance, the blood of Christ, in the world that can wash you, that can cleanse your conscience from dead works. Dead works. Your works produce nothing. Dead works to serve the living and true God. God is able to do that, to wash you. Secondly, I want us to look at the love that embraced her. Mike Iaconelli says this, grace does not exist, follow along with me, to make us successful. God's grace exists to point people to a love like no other love they have ever known, a love outside the lines. We were all children at one point in time. Did we, when we were children, understand the love that our mother had for us? <laughs> Not really. We, we appreciated 
this and that and all the different things that they did. But to understand it? No, no. Only when you become older, only when you become perhaps a mother yourself. It's a love that's outside the lines. And this woman who comes, <clears throat> she barges into this dinner. Somehow in her mind, it didn't matter if Jesus was there, that Jesus was approachable, accessible, attentive. And it's a place where she could find acceptance. She had been trying to fill this hole in her heart, and it just wasn't working. And she found someone, a love outside the lines, another kind of love. A love that won't leave, a love that won't forsake. A mother's kind of love for her child. You know that kind of love? Have you experienced this love of the Father in your heart? Not just knowing it, oh yeah, God so loved the world. How about you? That he loves you personally. Love is a personal thing. The love that embraced her. I want you you gals to say this verse again out loud. Start, I'll start, and then you finish. I want to hear your voices. May the... May it be. What? The grace of the Lord Jesus. No one is as gracious as Jesus. And the love of God... The other, it said, of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And I believe that this woman experienced the fellowship. If you wanted, you could put friendship in there that transformed her. Otherwise, there's no way she could barge into a Pharisee's house like she did and fall down at the feet of Jesus and worship and pour out her thanks and praise to him. What did she experience? Well, uh, look at the text. Verse 47. Jesus, in the meantime, had something to say to Simon. If you look at verse 40, Simon, I have something to say to you. A money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. That's a little over, you know, a year and a half day's wages or so, and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. Which of them will love him the mo more, the most? Well, at least Simon's thinking. He's a Pharisee. He should be able to think. Simon answered and said, I suppose the one we forgave more. And he said, you have judged correctly. Turning to the woman, he said to, to Simon. He's turning to the woman, but he's saying it to Simon. Do you see this woman? You don't see her as I see her, basically. I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. That was a common, ordinary thing to do. But she's wet my feet with her tears, wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. Common thing to do. But she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. Now here's verse 7. 47, 747, I like that. I used to, I fly, I've flown a lot of 747s. For this reason I say to you, this is to Simon, her sins, which are many, I could put my name in there, Glenn's sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much. But he or she who is forgiven little loves a little. She experienced the forgiveness that she needed. She experienced the assurance. This is coming from the lips of Jesus who never told one single lie, who always spoke the truth. They're forgiven. 
She loved much. He commends her for what she did, coming, kissing, wiping, wetting your feet with her tears. And then he says to the woman, Well, verse 49, those who were reclining at the table, maybe a bunch of other Pharisees, we don't know how many, began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? Well, friends, he's the son of God. He's the savior of the world. He's the king above all kings. He said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Shalom. Well content. Accepted. You are accepted by faith in Christ, in the beloved. There's nothing that you or I can do. We just finished this series. He gets you. He's got you. He's got the whole world in his hands, but... <clears throat> Just like mother got your child, it's mine. The Lord knows those who are his. He knows his own. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give on to them eternal life. They cannot perish. Why? Because he's the one who keeps. He's the one who keeps us secure. He's the guarantor of our salvation. It's not up to me. Now, <clears throat> this is called the, the fellowship that transforms. Remember, it's the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. I, I, I want you, as I close today, I want you to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit gives you, if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, a no condemnation status. Tonight I fly out to uh, Zimbabwe for seven weeks. I'm not flying first class. I've never flown first class. Patty and I came home with a friend of Kelly's uh, when she was in Kenya. We got into business class once for, for some odd reason. But otherwise, I'm always at the back of the, you know, somewhere in there. I'd, but he, Jesus gives a no condemnation status to everyone who comes, regardless of your, your sexuality, your ethnicity. It does not matter. And the book of Romans tells us about this great salvation that we have. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, is the power of God onto salvation, eternal salvation, to those who believe, who live and come to him by faith. And so the book of Romans tells us how the penalty of sin has been paid for. That's through the blood of Christ. That's Romans chapter, well, three to, three to five, basically. Romans chapter six tells us that the power of sin now in your life in my life as believers, has been broken. We don't have to give in anymore. Chapter 7, well, that's if you try to go back to the law. You try to live the Christian life under your own strength. You, you'll end up being a complete failure and struggle, struggle, struggle. Why, don't, why do I do this? I, the very things I don't want to do, sometimes I do. And then it ends, chapter 7, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? Good question. Who? And then you start chapter 8. Look at the first verse there. Therefore, there is no, how much? No, none, zippo, zero, nada. No condemnation for those who are, notice this, a Christian is someone who is in Christ Jesus, and Christ Jesus is in them. It's called union and then after that comes communion. It's a relationship that we have. 
No condemnation status. What does he do? The Holy Spirit. We're going to have it in John coming up. When the Holy Spirit comes, Jesus said, and I've promised him to you, and it's better if I get out of here and go away. If I don't go away, the Holy Spirit doesn't come. But when he comes, he's going to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. He's going to do his convicting work in your heart and in my heart. And he is the one who's going to work faith and repentance here. Inside. What does he do? Why is there no condemnation? Well, look at verse 2. For the law, law of the Spirit, of life, in a person, Christ Jesus, has set you free from the law of sin and death. The wages of sin is? It's death. So he frees you from this law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Uh, now I preach several next six, seven weeks in Zimbabwe. I would get a hallelujah or an amen or a few of those there. But anyway, God did. All right. Now notice he, he sent, sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He had to be made flesh. As an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. He enables now inwardly to fulfill. He fulfilled every, all of it, the whole bit, every jot, every tittle of the law. Now notice verse 4. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. He enables you to fulfill the law, and he gives you a brand new nature, his life in you. And then he confirms your identity. If you look on, on down, verse 9, in between it talks about the flesh those who are in the flesh and those who are in the spirit. There's only two kinds of people in the world, those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ. There's the saints and the ain'ts. Okay? Those who are in the flesh and those who are in the spirit. It's a distinction. The lost, the found. You can put it any number of, of ways. And so we as believers now are not to set our mind anymore because we have the mind of Christ, according to the book of, of Corinthians, we have the mind of his, his mind now. So we're not to think his thoughts. We are to uh, suck honey from the rock, from the word of God. So he confirms our identity. You're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. And he goes on and he talks about in this chapter, he talks about, uh, <clears throat> well, look at verse 16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. How do I know that I'm a believer? The Holy Spirit confirms it in my heart that I'm a child of God. And if children, heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. And then he aids us in our prayers. We don't even know how to pray as we should. But the scriptures here tell us that the Holy Spirit, in verse 23, groans within us, even if your words don't come out right. He aids us. And then he guarantees your eternal glory. Look at verse 28. We know... This is not just a, it's a Greek word, gnosko. There's a word that, intellect, you can know something here, and then you can know it by experience. We know. There's a certainty there. 
that God causes all things to work for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. There are bad things in this world, and bad things happen to God's people like they happen to everyone else. But God can cause even those things to work together for his honor, for his praise. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among all brethren. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, these he also glorified. Those are past tense. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against you? Who can be against me? Let all the flaming missiles of the evil one come. Let all the onslaught of people in this world, whatever they say about us or whatever they do to us, it doesn't matter. If God is for us, who can be against us? Then verse 32, he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all when we were enemies, when we were rebellious, when we were sinners by nature and choice, now that we're his, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? What shall we say to these things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Who shall separate us from all of it? There are four questions here. Not a thing in the world can separate you children from the love of your mother, period. It ain't gonna happen. It's what God puts in the heart of a mom. And our Father has a love for you and a love for me that you cannot figure out. I want you gals to say this verse with me for the third time today. Would you, the grace... This is Paul's final word to the Corinthians, which was not a glowing church. They have their problems like we have our problems here at Valley Church. Every church struggles. There's no perfect churches. This is his prayer. We often use it as a benediction. But it's what I want you gals to go away with today, the grace would you glory in his grace? Would you think about his love, think about his goodness, think about his grace that's brought you through, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all until he comes. Father, we pause. We give you thanks <clears throat> this day for our mothers. Many of us here have buried our mothers, buried our fathers. They're not with us, but we have precious memories. May they linger. May we stop and think about what our moms have done for us. And Lord, I pray for all of my sisters here today, that they would see themselves through your eyes. And then beyond that, that they would begin to look at other people through your eyes. We want to see ourselves as we really are and what you think about us, but we also then want to get our mind and eyes off of ourselves onto you and then onto people. And so, Lord, as the worship team comes and we sing a closing worship song, may you minister to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.